today we will talk about the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a thin muscular tendinous. This is a muscular tendinous seat. Hence, both the muscles and the tendons are over there, which form the partition between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity. It form it is a muscular tendinous seat which forms the partition between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity. It has got a right and the left dome, and the both the convexity of the dome they meet at structure which is known as the copula. It is being perforated by the structures which enters into the thorax and which comes from the thorax. Mm -hmm. Now, the inner portion of the, this diaphragm is in C-shaped central tendon. It has got a C-shaped central tendon. And upon this tendon, the, the, the circumferential arranged muscles, they attach to it. That means, if it has got a C-shaped structure like this, if it is a C-shaped structure like this, and the periphery of the, the diagram. So the muscle fiber are arranged in the radial manner into the central tendon. Now the muscle fiber will arrange into the radial manner into the central tendon, and these fibers are divided, they come from either the anteriorly, the external part, the laterally from the costal part, and posteriorly from the lumbar part. <clears throat> So the radially arranged muscle layer like this, they will come over here, over like this, they will go like this. So these are the muscles and this is the central tendon, this is the central tendon. So in the central tendon, the radially arranged muscle will come to get attached to it, number one point and number second point, the muscles which are coming to attach to the central tendon. They are either coming anteriorly from the external part, posteriorly from the lumbar part, and laterally from the postural part. So these are this is the introduction of the diaphragm, and it is in a muscular tendinous seat, which will form the partition between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity. Now coming to the sternal part. Now, sternal part it arises from the inner surface of the gyphoid process. We have the gyphoid process over here, we have got the gyphoid process over here, and we have got the attachment of the attachment of the diaphragm from here. So it will attach from this gyphoid process, this is the gyphoid process. <coughs> and from this gyphoid process, the, this will attach and it will go run upward and the backward to get inserted into the central tendon. And it will go to inter, attach to the central tendon, which you will see in the next slide. So it is a gyphoid process from here. It is coming anteriorly. Now the costal part, this costal part arises from the lower six rib. Tell from the lower six rib. That means the seven, eight, and nine, and ten, eleven, and twelve. Ten, eleven, and twelve. This sixth rib will from the seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, it will come from as the costal cartilage, from the costal cartilage. Seven, eight, nine, it will come from the costal cartilage, and from the nine, ten, and eleven, it will come from the rib. It will come from the rib. And again, from here, either from the 7, 8, 9, the costal cartilage, or from the 9, 10, 10, 11, 12, the ribs, it will go again to get inserted into the central tendon. These are the ribs. This is, these are the lateral margin, where the, the ribs are coming out. Now coming to the lumbar part, and the lumbar part is a quite bit important 
and it has it arises from the right and left pura. It arises from the right and left pura, and with this pura, it attached to the upper three lumbar vertebra. It attached to the upper three lumbar vertebra, and this and it has got right and left pura, and also it has got median and lateral arcuate ligament. Through this right and left pura and median and lateral. Arcuate ligament, the lumbar part of the diaphragm arises from the lumbar vertebra to get inserted again into the central tendon. So, the anterior part coming from the gyphoid process getting inserted into the central tendon, the lateral part coming from the costal cartilage 7, 8, 9, or the ribs 10, 11, 12 getting inserted into the central tendon, and again the lumbar part which is coming from the upper 3, L1, L2, L3 vertebra. In form of the right and left pura and the median and lateral arcuate ligament, and they again inserted into the, the central tendon. So this is this is the left side, this is right side. So see this one. This is the left crust. And this is the right crust. This is the left crust, and this is the right crust. Left. This is right crust, and both of them are coming from the lumbar vertebra. To the right and left, the pura are firmly attached to the front of the vertebral column, which we have seen. So they are tenderness in their lower part and above become muscular. So to begin with, you can see over here that in this diagram, this portion, this portion is looking like tenderness. This is looking like tenderness. This is looking like tenderness. So to begin with, they are tenderness and soon become, it will become the muscular. The initial attachment is tenderness and to, finally it becomes the muscular. Right crust is wider and one vertebra segment longer than the left. This right crust, this right crust is one, see, this is the right side and this is the left side. This is the left side. So the right crust, this is, you see the right crust of the diaphragm? The right crust of the diaphragm, this is one, but this is L1, this is L2, this is L3, and so on and so forth. So, the, it is coming up to the L3 vertebra L, and the, in the intervertebra is and it is up to the L2 vertebra. One vertebra level less, one vertebra level less, one vertebra level more with the this right cross of the diaphragm. Right cross of the diaphragm is having the one vertebra level more than the left cross of the diaphragm. So it arises from the upper four lumbar vertebra and the intervertebra is upper four lumbar vertebra and the intervertebral disc and these pura are united together in the midline to form the median arcuate ligament. Both of them will unite together to form the median arcuate ligament. See this one. This is the right crust. This is the right crust going like this. The right crust. The left crust, this right crust is meeting and left crust is meeting together at this point and this point is the median arcuate ligament. The meeting point of the both of them are this from the median arcuate ligament. This from the median arcuate ligament. This from the median arcuate ligament.
So the median arcuate ligament, this median arcuate ligament will be at the L2 level. This is this is the L L1 vertebra. This is the one vertebra level less. We have got the median arcuate ligament. And see the median and lateral, they unite together at this point, and this is called the median arcuate ligament. Median arcuate ligament. So the medial We have seen the right and left cells of the diaphragm. Now we come to the median arcuate ligament. So the median arcuate ligament it extends from the transverse process of the L1. It extends from the transverse process of the L1, and it passes over the sparse major muscle. It will pass over the sparse major muscle to meet the to blend with the corresponding crust of the diaphragm, and the, the nearest one will be the the right crust of the diaphragm on the right side and the left crust of diaphragm on the left side. So it extends from the transverse process of L1. See the transverse process of L1. This is the transverse process of L1. This is the L1, L1 vertebra. And we have got transverse process over here. And this is the how the median this is coming like this. It is coming like this and it blends with the 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 right crust of the diaphragm on the right side and it will blend with the left crust of diaphragm on the left side. Blend with the left crust of diaphragm on the left side. It will go like this. Like this. For the lateral arcuate ligament, the lateral arcuate ligament is extended across the quadrant from the 12th rib. See this one. This is the this is the transverse, this is the vertebra transverse process, and we have got the this. A, this is the, the, the transverse process of L1 and it is giving rise to the median arcuate, median arcuate ligament. This is the median arcuate ligament. And this median arcuate ligament is over the sparse muscle, major muscle. This is the left sparse major muscle, we have the right side sparse major muscle. So this median arcuate ligament is the is coming from the transverse process of L1 vertebra, transverse process of L1 vertebra. And it meets the it it will meet the it, it will meet the corresponding side of the, the crust of the the diaphragm and on the right side it will meet the right crust of diaphragm only the left side will meet the left crust of diaphragm and this will be over the swath major muscle this will be over the swath major muscle right side on the right swath major muscle and left side it will be on the left swath major but the we have got the lateral arcuate ligament. This lateral arcuate ligament is coming from the 12th rib. Here we have got the 12th rib. Here we have got the 12th rib. And from the 12th rib, this is coming. This is coming out. This is the. And it will go up to the transverse process of L, the L1. From where the median arcuate ligament, medial arcuate ligament is start, the lateral ligament will end. The medial ligament, medial <coughs> arcuate ligament will come up to the crust of the diaphragm and the lateral arcuate ligament will come up to the median arcuate ligament, medial arcuate ligament. So we have got this, this is the left arc, this one, and see the left lateral arcuate ligament and this is over the quadratus lumborum muscle. This is over the quadratus lumborum muscle, this will be over the quadratus lumborum muscle. <coughs> so this will be over the quadratus lumborum muscle. <clears throat> so the right crust of diaphragm and the left crust of diaphragm together they form the together they form the median arcuate ligament. They form the median arcuate ligament. <clears throat> now we have got three named apertures in the diaphragm. One is the erotic hiatus, second one is the esophageal hiatus, and third one is the foramen of IBC that is the foramen of Vena Keva. So 
So we could see over there, this one is the right cross of diaphragm, visible, yes, right cross of diaphragm, the left cross of diaphragm, they together forming the median arcuit ligament. We have got the, the medial, median arcuit ligament, we have got the medial arcuit ligament, we have got the lateral arcuit ligament. Lateral arcuit ligament coming from the 12th rib, coming up to the, the transverse posterior L1. From the transverse posterior L1, it is the medial arcuit ligament coming up to the right cross of diaphragm on the right side and to the left cross of diaphragm on the left side. We have got the lateral arcuit ligament, we have got the lateral arcuit ligament coming from the 12th rib. Now we have got the three opening. One is the erotic hiatus, second one is the esophageal, and we have got the from inferior vena cava. The level of the T12, T10, and T8. So we have got three levels. We have got the one level over here, we have got second level over here, and we have got third level over here. So the inferior vena cava is upper the highest one. So this will be at the T8 level. This will be at the T8 level. Then next we have got the esophageal hiatus. So this will be at the T10 level and this will be at the T12 level. That is the erotic opening. Erotic opening will be at the T12 level. Erotic opening will be at the T12 level. Now erotic opening. This erotic opening, if we could see that this is the lateral arcuate ligament, this is the medial arcuate ligament and this, this forming the median, this is the right crest, left crest and forming the median arcuate ligament which we have just read now, that this is the right cross of the diaphragm, which is the right cross of diaphragm going like this, and the left cross of diaphragm meeting together, they forming the medial arcuate ligament, and we have got a gap over here, we have got a gap over here, and this gap is actually between the vertebra and the medial arcuate ligament, in between the, the lumbar vertebra and the this median arcuate ligament, we have we could find that there is a gap over here and this is the central tendon this is the central tendon this one is the central tendon the c-shaped central tendon so it is located behind not within is the important point this is located behind and not within the diaphragm and it goes by the 12 thoracic vertebra behind and the true crudo medial and the median arcuate medial arcuate ligament and the medial arcuate medial arcuate ligament and the structure passing through is not the median median is the median 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 arcuate ligament and the structure passing through it is aorta thoracic duct and the vagus vein as the name suggests aorta a o r a o r t a. It is the aorta, it is thoracic duct, the ajagus vein. So, in the name of the aorta, we have we have got the three structure which passes through the aortic opening. So, since these structures are located behind the, the diaphragm, it is not passing through the diaphragm, it is located behind the diaphragm, so it will be not compressed by the contraction of the diaphragm. So it will be not compressed by the contraction of the diaphragm. Next we have got the osophageal opening and this osophageal opening is actually formed by with the right cross of diaphragm, it is actually formed by the right cross of diaphragm, medial fiber of the right cross of diaphragm, but it is situated on the left side. So this is the left side and this is the right side. And you could see that it is the right cross of diaphragm, it is going like this, going like this. And some of the fiber, some of the fiber, it formed like this, this fiber like this, coming like this. And it is creating the osteophagia fissure. So it is actually between, within the fibers of the right cross of the diaphragm. So it will have some contraction, the, the sphincter mechanism will be provided by the right cross of diaphragm. Since it is within the, it is, since it is within the right cross of the diaphragm, right cross of the diaphragm, so when it will contract, the right crest will contract, it will, it will contract the osophageal hiatus. So it is slightly on the left of the midline, it is slightly on the left of the midline, you could draw the midline over here, so it is slightly on the left side, lie at the level of T10 which we have already discussed and the structure which passes through this one along with the esophagus, we have the right and left vagal trunk which passes through this one 
and orthophageal branches of the gastric vessels. Orthophageal branches of the gastric vessels, which will, this will also pass through this orthophageal opening. So, to, to conclude, the orthophageal opening is situated on the slightly on the left side of the midline, and it is situated in the right cross of diaphragm, not on the left cross of diaphragm, even though it is on the left side. And this thin it is situated in the right cross of diaphragm, it will be contracted by it will be contracted by the contraction of the right cross of the diaphragm. Now we come to the pharyngeoesophageal ligament. There is a ligament called the pharyngeoesophageal ligament. If you have got any structure like this, and if something will pass through this one, if something will pass through this one, this could with the con with the contraction of this one, this will contract, okay, but it will give some sort of a space through which any structure could pass through it. To prevent this one, we have got the pharyngeal ligament, which is coming from the diaphragm. It is coming within. If this is the diaphragm, if this is diaphragm, so this ligament is actually coming. It is coming within. It is coming within. It is coming within. And we have got the osophagus. We have got the esophagus over here. We have esophagus is passing through this one. So this ligament will pass through the this esophageal aperture from the diaphragm, and it will get attached. It will get attached to the esophagus. It will get attached to the esophagus. So we are seeing in this diagram that this is the liver. We have got a diaphragm over here. We have got a diaphragm over. This is the diaphragm, and this one is the thoracic duct. And this one is the esophagus. This is the gastroesophageal junction. This is the gastroesophageal junction. And we have got the pharyngeal ligament. See this one. This ligament is coming from within. It is coming from here. It is coming from this one, coming like this, and it is going like this, and it attaches to those figures. So it will not allow any structure to pass through this one. Any structure, if you try to pass through this one, it, it will not allow any structure to pass through this one, and it has got. A neck it is attached to the neck of the osophagus, neck of, of the osophagus, so it will not allow any structure to pass through this one. So this is the role of the pharyngeal ligament. It is the communication between the thoracic and abdominal cavity. The through the osophageal hiatus is sealed off by the fibroblastic membrane known as the pharyngeal ligament. It actually seals the connection between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity, which is being created by the, the passage of the osophagus. Now. This is the subdiaphragmatic fossa. This is the subdiaphragmatic fossa attached to the muscular wall of the esophageal above the gastroesophageal junction and it will attach just above the gastroesophageal junction. Now we have got the vena cable opening. So we have seen, we are on the third opening, we have seen the erotic opening. Erotic opening was just behind the diaphragm. The contraction of the, it is, and the contraction of the diaphragm is not affected at all. The, 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 the erota. Second one, the osophageal opening, it is situated in the right cross of the diaphragm, and the right cross of the diaphragm acts as a suture for the diaphragm. And now, third one is the vena cable opening, which is at the higher level T12, T10, and now we are at the T8 level. 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 This is situated in the central tendon. This is situated in the central tendon. This is situated in the central tendon. And right, vena cava is there. That means we have must have the, the right atrium over the diaphragm. It is situated just over the right atrium, situated just over the atrium, and through which the it will easily pass through this one. Number one. Next, the most important point is that since it is situated in the central tendon, it's not the muscle; it is tendon. Central tendon, when it will contract, it will pull the contraction of the central tendon will pull the the structure attached to it, and the inferior vena cava. It attached to the wall of the central tendon, 
to the when the tendon will contract it will pull the the inferior vena cava and the lumen of the diameter of inferior vena cava will increase and the more blood will pass from the abdominal cavity to the thoracic cavity so it is located in the central tendon of the right side in of the midline or the facial opening is in the left side of the midline and the inferior vena cava opening is on the right side of the midline Inferior vena cava is firmly attached to the margin of the foramen. The margin of the foramen in the foramen created in the inferior vena cava itself. And that contraction stretches the vena cava opening, adding the venous flow to the abdomen towards the heart. And the most important thing is that it is the right phrenic nerve which passes through this vena cava opening. This will allow the passage of the right phrenic nerve. The right phrenic nerve will pass through this vena cava opening. The right phrenic nerve will pass through this vena cava opening. Now we have got the few smaller op opening in the diaphragm. We have seen the three major ones, the arthritic, the esophageal, and the vena cava opening. None of them were situated, were, were passing the muscular part of the Diaphragm. Now we have got the few smaller opening. One is the sternocostal triangle space of the larry. The sternocostal, we see the sternum over here. So sternocostal, and we have got the, this here. We have got the two small aperture, and it's the gap between the sternum and the costal fiber of the diaphragm. And the opening is enlarged, then it is known as the foramen of Morgigny. When it will be enlarged, then it will be known as the foramen of Morgigny. And through this, we will pass the And next we have got the, the, the next one is sympathetic trunk lying behind the median arcuate ligament. So we have got the medial arcuate ligament over here, medial arcuate and just over here we will have the, this will allow the passes of sympathetic trunk will pass to the just behind the medial arcuate ligament. Just behind the medial arcuate ligament we will have this one. The subcostal nerve descend behind the lateral arcuate ligament. So lateral arcuate ligament we are here we will have the subcostal Subcostal nerve, subcostal nerve, we will get over this structure. That is the median arcuate ligament. Just behind the median arcuate ligament, we have got sympathetic trunk. Just behind the lateral arcuate ligament, we have got the subcostal nerve. Now, the greater and the lesser is planking nerve. This piercing the crust of the diaphragm. This pierces the crust of the diaphragm. The right crust and left crust over here, here, and it will pierce the crust of the diaphragm. And the left phrenic nerve pierces the diaphragm near the apex of the pericardial sac. We will see in the next diagram. So it will pierce the, the, the diaphragm near where the apex of the heart will be there. And behind the cura is in the lumbar vein between the ejagus and the hemijagus vein. That becomes the head. Through this one, it will pass the just behind the cura. We have got the jagus and the hemi, uh, lumbar vein, and this becomes the hemi jagus and jagus vein. And see this one, the apex is over here, and we have got the phrenic nerve over here. Phrenic nerve over here. This is the phrenic nerve. This is the phrenic nerve, and this phrenic nerve will pass through this pass through where the apex of there, and it will pass through the diaphragm. So the right phrenic nerve, the right phrenic nerve. This is the left side. This is the right side. So the right phrenic nerve, where the right atrium is there, and it will pass through this one to the vena cava opening, the vena cava opening, to the vena cava opening, and the left phrenic nerve will pass where the apex of the heart will be there, and it will pass through the the diaphragm. Now, in some relations, the upper relation is the, is the, is the pleura. We have got the, the pleura and the pericardium in contact with the lung also. So, we have got the pleura over there, the lung on the either side. So, this is the lung and the pleura, which is in direct contact with the diaphragm above surface. Below, we have got 
the structures that liver is over here, the stomach is over here. So we have the liver, stomach, of course the spleen is over here, so the spleen will be there. And all the structures, the subphrenic space between diaphragm and these organs, the subphrenic structure the, between the liver and the diaphragm, between the stomach and diaphragm, between the spleen and the diaphragm, we will get the spaces and this structure will be known as the subphrenic spaces and the lower part of course we will get the kidney and the supraadrenal gland also. Now coming to the blood supply, the blood supply is mainly from the inferior phrenic artery. The inferior phrenic artery is the main blood supply and it is the first branch of the abdominal aorta. This is the first branch of the abdominal aorta and they are paired artery. They are the paired artery. So this is the, this is the inferior phrenic artery and this is the inferior phrenic artery is coming from the abdominal aorta and this will be the paired one on the either side. <clears throat> and it will supply the diaphragm. Second one is the superior phrenic artery coming from the thoracic aorta. We have got the superior phrenic artery. So we have got the inferior phrenic artery and we have got the superior phrenic artery. Third one is the musculophrenic artery. And fourth one is the intercostal artery. They are the intercostal artery. They are the intercostal artery. And this intercostal artery, posterior intercostal artery, will supply the diaphragm. Regarding the vein, we know. The, it will be the, the right side will drain into the inferior vena cava and the left side will drain into the left suprarenal or the left renal vein. Left inferior vena cava or left renal vein. So this is different. This is the question that the right side of the vein of the diaphragm will drain where and the left side of the vein of the diaphragm will drain where. Now regarding the, the nerve supply, we have got the motor. As we know, that is this the C3, C4, C5 is the phrenic nerve which supplies the diaphragm. And each nerve pierces the diaphragm. We already we have already we already know that the right side of the phrenic nerve coming to the inferior vena cava and the left side to the apex of the heart. And the sensory, the larger part by the phrenic nerve, larger central part is by the, the phrenic nerve, and the peripheral bar part by the intercostal nerve. So the central part, since it is being supplied by the phrenic nerve to the the referred pain will pass to, to the, the root and the neck of the shoulder because they have got the same root value that is the C3, C4 and C5. So it will refer to the root of the neck and the shoulder and the peripheral part is being taken care by the intercostal nerve. Now the action, we already know that the principal action of the muscle is raise the intra-abdominal pressure. During inspiration, the vena cava opening dilates to so that the venous return increases and it also constricts the oesophageal opening during the inspiration. So it is the chief, it is the chief muscle of the inspiration. Vena cava opening of the opening with the contraction is exercised and the vena cava opening get the more blood and oesophageal opening have got the constriction effect. The valvular effect as it passes to the right crust of diaphragm. Now, development only few points that it will come from the septum transversarium. This is the septum transversarium over here. We have got a septum transversarium over here, and this septum transversarium will form the central tendon and most of the muscular part anterior to it. It will form the central tendon and most of the and we have got a dead dorsal mesentery of the oesophagus or major oesophagus. And then the pleuro peritoneal membrane. We have got the pleuro peritoneal membrane. And this pleuro peritoneal membrane, it closes the communication between the pleura and the peritoneum and from the posterolateral partition of the central tendon. This is from the posterolateral partition of the central tendon. And finally, the somatic mesoderm of the body wall. And this will form the peripheral muscular part. From the peripheral muscular part. This peripheral muscular part will be formed by this one. Now, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Cause of the presence of liver and the right pleuro-peritoneal canal 
two days early, while the left canal will persist longer. Since we have got the liver on the left side, so it will, so sorry, right side, so it will close earlier. Right side and left side will close later. If it is not closed by the time the intestine is returned to the peritoneal cavity from the umbilical genome, the abdominal contents, the stomach and the small intestine will herniate up into the thorax and lie in the pleural cavity through the foramen of Bogdalek. So see this one, the abdominal, it's, it will not, con which will not contract the pleural, this is the pleuroperitoneal canal, pleuroperitoneal canal, this pleuroperitoneal canal, if it is not closed, then it will be allow the uh, abdominal content to remain over here and this will form the congenital hernia and since it will occupy the most of the space of the thorax so the lung will be hypoplastic with decreased pulmonary and branchial arterial branching so why this congenital hernia occurs it is due to the failure of the pleuro peritoneal canal to get sealed off with the time of development now we have got the eversion of the diaphragm. The, the herniation occur after the diaphragm has been completed. Now this in this diaphragm, we have got the completion of the, 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 the membrane has completed. Earlier what we have got, we have got in the early, this scene, we have got a diaphragm over there and come not completed. So all the contents will go like this. All contents will be lie over here. But in this case, since the membrane has completed form, so the, whatever content will be over there, they will be surrounded by the membrane. They will be surrounded by the membrane and you could see the diagram over here. It is surrounded by the membrane. Only the level will increase. So the herniation occur after diaphragm has been completed, but before the plural peritoneal membrane has been strengthened by the muscle. Membrane has been formed, but it has not been strengthened by the muscle. So it will allow the structure. So in this case, herniated intense sac is covered by the peritoneum and is called the evernation of the diaphragm. So the only difference between the congenital hernia and the evernation is that in congenital hernia, we don't have the plural, the complete development of the diaphragm and not com, com, diaphragm was not developed completely. And so the abdominal content was in the the thoracic cavity. But here in this case. The, the diaphragm development is complete. It is only the pleuroperitoneal membrane which has not been strengthened by the muscle. So the structure which will enter into the thorax will have the covering of the peritoneum. They have covering of the peritoneum. Now the hiatal hernia through the esophageal opening. This is the normal case. This is the normal Osophagus, we have got the diaphragm over here, we have the diaphragm over here, and we have got the osophagus over here, and we have got the stomach over here. In sliding hernia, what, what is happening in sliding? It will just slide. So you have got this level will go over here. This level will go over here. In sliding hernia, the this cardiac level, this, this level will go over here. This level will go over here, only the level will change. Protrusion of the structure to the osophageal hiatus of the diaphragm. The osophageal hiatus, to the osophageal hiatus, there will be protrusion of the structure. And the pharyngeal hernia, here the, the membrane, the pharyngeal membrane is now weaker and it will allow the passage of the structure to the osophagus, osophageal opening, and so the structure will be lying here. It will, it's not the level will change, it is only the some part of the abdomen some part of the stomach will enter into the, 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 the thorax through the side of the esophagus due to the weakening of, due to the weak, weak pharyngeal esophageal membrane and the cardia remaining in the abdomen but the fundus and the body part balloon up into the thorax. So if it will slide like this, it will slide like this and it will pass through the lateral side. Now one important clinical question, a 35 year, a 35 year old male patient sustained a RTA presented with the pain in the left upper abdomen with suspicious of the abdominal injury. On examination, bruises on the lower chest and imprint of the vehicle wheel on the left side, abdominal wall present. 
tendon is on palpation palpation and fracture rib on the left side of the chest after foot and elevation pain in the left shoulder starts name the most likely injured organ why does the pain start after foot and elevation and the structure of the organ responsible for the effort pain so the, the structure most likely to injury is the diaphragm why the pain start after foot elevation the foot will be elevated and more pressure over the diaphragm so they will get the patient will get more pain and the structure which is more responsible for the effort pain to the phrenic nerve with the pain will be felt over the left side of the neck and the shoulder shoulder joint so this is all about the diaphragm thank you